Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Big Conversations Week 6, where we tackle not just the social issues, but the theological issues uh, that are brought out throughout the Bible. Uh, now, this particular one, I hear more from deconstructing Christians than I do atheists. You will hear folks like Sam Harris and others bring it up, uh, but it's, I cannot believe in God because God condones genocide. There's actually a book written that says, I don't believe in God because God is a genocidal maniac. Now, we're going to unpack those terms, and we're going to unpack those words and definitions because they matter. But Richard Dawkins would not even debate uh, William Lane Craig. Richard Dawkins is a, uh, a very famous atheist scientist philosopher who wouldn't debate William Lane Craig, who is a Christian um, philosopher, scientist, and apologist, because he says he defends genocide, and he would not be worth that time. So let's let's make sure that that's a what we're talking about. Are we talking about genocide? And b what does the scripture actually say about these things? So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter nine verse three. It says, "Know therefore today that he who goes over you is a consuming fire, is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you, and you will drive them out and make them perish quickly, as the Lord has promised you." So the goal is to drive these people out. Genocide is about ethnic cleansing. That's saying you're a different ethnic group than I am, so I'm going to eradicate you from the earth. And so that's not exactly what God's telling them to do. He says, drive them out. You said, but pastor says, perish quickly. Don't worry. I'm not omitting. We're going to get there. Um, but it says, as the Lord has promised you. This is God who is asking the Israelites to do this. Now, this matters for a couple of reasons. Number one. The Canaanites were not just this small little culture. They were a brutal culture. Their, their worship uh, was to Dagon, Moloch, Baal, uh, and it was, it was violent and it was vile. We actually see some of it unpacked later in the Old Testament. But as part of worship to Moloch, you would put people in what's called a brass bull, which was a metal bull, and you would put sacrifices of people alive in it and put hot coals under the bull, and their screams that would come out of the bull's mouth when it was supposed to sound like the animal, but it was part of the worship to Moloch, and they tended to use children over anyone else. And that doesn't come from in the Bible, that comes from history and antiquity. So in other words, it's not the Bible making an excuse for itself to do this. History gives us a painted picture of the Canaanites, and yes, there's different tribes, uh, you'll see that kind of listed here, um, but they followed similar deities and conducted themselves a certain way. And the other thing to keep in mind is, who are the Israelites? They're nobody. They were slaves released from Egypt. The Canaanites had cities and fortifications. They had trained armies. Uh, they would have had weapons and armor and chariots far greater than anything the Israelites have. They don't have trained anyone in Israel. They were slaves. The only thing they know how to do is get beat. And so God says, I'm going to deliver this land of warriors to you, a bunch of nobodies. So it wasn't like Israel said, here we are, these strong people, and here's these poor strawberry farmers who want to go take all their land. This is, we are nobody, and God's asking us to go do this. Now keep in mind, if Israel was not going to do this, guess who was going to take Israel? The Canaanites or the Egyptians. When you were, when you were just wandering the desert, you were, you were prime taking for slavery. And we're not talking about the slavery like we did last week, where the Israelites had a way different way of looking at it. This would have been filled with cruelty and, mal and malice they, that this world uh, wouldn't, wouldn't even believe today. And you say, well, Pastor, how can you even say that? How do you know that? Look, I spent time in India, and I'm you know, here to disparage an entire subcontinent. But we were there to see um, the practice of temple prostitution um, within certain, certain gods. And you, most of those people, most of those young ladies only lived about the age of 13. And this is today. We're not even talking the ancient world. So you, most of the folks who had been taken to worship because of how they were used and abused probably wouldn't have made it much longer than that if they made it to even 10 years old. But So let's, let's keep reading. Let's see what goes on here. This is Deuteronomy 20, verses 10 through 18. So when you draw near to a city to fight against it, Offer terms of peace to it. And if it responds to you peaceably, and it opens to you, then all the people who are found in shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. Going back to what we talked about last week. But if it makes no peace with you, but makes war against you, you shall besiege it. 
And when the Lord gives it into your hand, you will put all the males to the sword. But the women, the little ones, the livestock, everything in the city, all its spoil, you shall take as plunder for yourselves. You shall enjoy the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far off from you, which are not cities of the nations here. But in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes. But you will devote to them complete destruction. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and the Lord your God has commanded. And that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practice that they have done for their gods. And so you sin against the Lord your God. I don't know how you can read this text and not go, wow. But we have to put it in its proper framing. Context matters. Historical context matters. So look, if they went to a city, they were offered peace. You don't do that in genocide. In genocide, you don't let them know you're coming. And then you show up and you kill as many of them as possible. That's not the goal here. And if they respond peaceably, then you're supposed to take all who found, you're all that were found in the city. You're like, what? So God is saying you can't just leave them there? Because guess what that means? No fighting men left for women and children. And going back again, how were slaves supposed to be treated? That goes back to last week. Six years, land of Jubilee, you said even for foreigners. Yes, even for foreigners. And I'm going to make proof text for that here in just a moment. But it says you're supposed to take everything. So I mean, in other words, if Israel was going to garner any kind of inheritance in which to start a nation, it was going to come from the taking of these cities. Now, keep in mind, there was several million Canaanites at the time. And if you look at the total conquest of Israel, around 70,000 people were the cities um, that were approached. Many cities, people probably, probably just ran and hid. And they were not told, then pursue them into the hills and strike them all down. Once they left, you leave them alone. It was about driving them out of the land as judgment. right? That's what this is about, God judging them. This isn't, again, us looking back and saying, oh, these were just these poor people and these rich Israelites came in. This was the kind of trying to stop Nazi Germany. Because if not, the Canaanites would have taken the Israelites as slaves. That, that's not really up for question, because that's how the ancient world worked. And I don't think many of us today sit there and say, well, stopping Nazi Germany was a bad thing. I mean, if you do, I suppose we could talk about it. But by and large, you, you, you stand up to evil, you don't just let it go. You say, but then it says, go, utter destruction to these people, killing them all. Again, peace is offered. And I'm going to prove through text that that's, that was not just hyperbole. That was an idiom of the day. Um, if you look at the Hebrew, um, and I, I actually read a Hebrew scholar on this. It says it's from men to women. In other words, whoever is going to fight, whoever is there, you, you can't let the fighting ones live. If they're going to fight to the last man, you fight to the last man. If they want quarter, you give them quarter. Right? And so uh, the idea of this is God would then assimilate them into Israel. You say, how do you, how do you know that's true? They took them as slaves. We talked about that last week. Well, Rahab is in the lineage of David and Jesus, and she was a Canaanite. She was in Jericho. She did not want to be with the people of Jericho either. Why? She was reduced to simply being a prostitute. She, In other words, she lived in a culture that her only way of making money and surviving was doing that. And when the Israelites came in and said, you can come with us, she said, okay, I'll hide you, but you got to take me with you. And they didn't say, nope, you're Canaanite. We have to ethnically cleanse you. No, they took her with her and her family. And not only that, she gets elevated as being mentioned into the lineage of Jesus. In other words, part of Jesus' lineage is he's from a quote-unquote Canaanite slave taken by the Hebrew people. Then you, you start going a little further. If you read further in the text past this, you see people from these groups do survive. And you don't see God chastise them at this time for leaving them as survivors. The only time you see God really chastise is, right, he says the thing about taking spoils. They were not supposed to take anything uh, of altars or of gods. Um, and we see in the town of Ai that happened, and God punishes Israel for that. Right? They took more than what they were allotted to take. This wasn't scorched earth policy. They weren't going through devastating everyone. They were trying to enact a judgment of God, and then have a place that the people of Israel could flourish. So you have the Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, Amorites, Hittites. 
Rahab is a Canaanite. You see later in Scripture, one of the 37 great men of David is Ahimelech. Uh, he becomes an advisor to David, so much so that when they're fighting Saul, Ahimelech gets to speak into David's life. Like, that is how much he has risen from he would have been taken as a quote-unquote slave. Going back to last week, connecting to this week. That means during this time, not only was he left alive, and God didn't just judge him for it, he honors Ahimelech himself. And he's allowed to go to a high office. You have Uriah, a Hittite, who to me is one of the greatest heroes we have in Scripture. Does not meet a great end. If you're not familiar with this story, when David takes Bathsheba, uh, and you can say her fault, his fault, doesn't matter. It's their fault, ultimately. Uriah is a faithful soldier, one of the 37 great men of Israel. He's the last one listed. In other words, when David needed something done, he was one of the guys who was faithful. And it lists him as a Hittite. There are several people groups listed under that 37 great men. Many of them are listed as a parentage through somewhere in Israel. But over half are people from another land who are not just elevated. They are put as heroes in the ancient world. So you can't say this was just about cleansing or it was about God literally saying kill every single person. Because those people got to rise. So Uriah does everything right. He even honors the Lord. So in other words, he didn't just assimilate to Hebrew culture. He became a follower of God. And he tells David, he's a far better example in the story than David ever was. He was faithful from beginning to end. And his life was taken from him because David knew he would be a man of courage, bravery, and he would follow orders. David had the army withdraw so that Uriah would be the only one fighting. And Uriah fought. Like Uriah didn't just get killed. I'm sure he had to see what was happening when the rest of the line withdrew. His order was to charge. So Uriah charged. Bravery, valor, honor integrity the hittite whom is supposed to be quote-unquote hated by god and driven from the land then you see ruth ruth is a moabite who actually comes from numbers 31 numbers 31 was a hard text for me i'll be very very transparent i wrestled with this text for multiple weeks because it's one of the few places where um the women were allowed to be taken as wives Uh, if you look at the the slavery was if they were taken, that means the whole family unit would be taken in. And goes back to what we talked about last week, six six years of, of, of freedom, to be given stuff, things of that nature. And yes, even foreigners were allowed to participate in that. Um, again, you would have had abuses. There's, there's no way around it. Um, I would love to say, and every Israelite did everything exactly the way they're supposed to. There's a whole Bible that points otherwise. But that was not God doing that or asking them to. So you have Ruth, who would have been an offspring of someone born into slavery, taken by Israel, who was allowed to be redeemed by Boaz, an Israelite, because of her mother-in-law. In In other words, she was a slave outsider who in every other part of the world would have been the lowest person on the possible totem pole. No one would have cared about a slave from another land. She would have been less less valuable than cattle or horses. But God said, even, <coughs> pardon me, even she can be redeemed. Even she has the option of being assimilated into the family of God. So we have to use the context of Scripture when we look at these things. There's an entire book called Ruth about how a woman from the outside who was a slave gets redeemed into the family of God. Do you see the heart of God in this? Yes, they were taken. But being left means you're just going to be taken by somebody else. And you say, well, Pastor, then why would God have them do this anyway? Because there's judgment. And I read a commentary, and I thought this was very powerful, that perhaps those of us today have become too sentimental about grace and not enough about God's holiness. Grace is important. Grace is the standard of Scripture. But the only reason we can appreciate grace is that you have to look at the absolute holiness of God. But you also have to understand the complete depravity of man. The Israelites were not being asked to go find 
poor farmers who couldn't defend themselves and to drive them out. These were fortified cities with walls and armies and kings, and they were the farmers and slaves who had nothing. It's an underdog story, if there ever was one. But I want us to look at all this in its proper context. Israel also was not exempt. The very reason God judged the Canaanites, he judged the Israelites. They were not exempt from this judgment. That's how they ended up in exile. They turned to the gods, these other gods. And if you wonder, what was so bad about them? Just read about King Ahab and Jezebel. And the cruelty in which they enacted and governed. Led because they were, had these priests of Baal. And it wasn't, and again, it was because of their religion. It was, you couldn't separate the two. Now, did that mean Jewish kings were always right? No, absolutely not. Just read Kings and you'll see very quickly they got it wrong, which is why judgment came. They allowed themselves to behave like the rest of the ancient world, which led to cruelty, to malice, to sexual morality being rampant, to people forgetting there was God. When King Josiah, at the age of eight, becomes king, he is presented with the law by a priest who is cleaning out the closet at the temple. And no one had ever heard of it. The priest knew. He had heard of it before. But no one in the royal court had even heard of the law. That's how far Israel had gone. And God brought judgment. But let's look at this. I want us to still end this with the heart of God. This heart of God is holiness. But it's ultimately redemption. Remember, peace was given to everyone. Every one of these people could have stood down, joined Israel, and had the rights of an Israelite, being an Israelite citizen. It may have taken time. It may not have been pretty. But we've already showed there was a chance for elevation. You don't have to look far to see God using people from outside Israel and their tribes. But John 3.16-21 through 21 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, and or that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe, they're condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. Light has come into the world, and the people loved darkness rather than the light. Because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light. And then does not come to the light. Lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light. So that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. God has always loved the world. So much so that he was going to redeem it himself. Through the blood of his only begotten son. Why? He says, you're already condemned because people love darkness more than they love light. The Canaanites had judgment, not because they were ignorant. God brought messengers called Israelites, and they spat in their face and said, I love my evil more than I love you. And again, to love God is to love the actually noun version of love, of goodness, of grace, of all of the good and attributes. They're saying your God comes with mercy and he comes with grace and he comes with this maybe pain be love stuff. Our gods are gods of war, of violence, of viciousness. We love that more. We love that it lets my sexual proclivities live out any way I want. Your God wants to limit me. My God, quote unquote, sets me free. But he sets them free to sin. And our God says, I'm trying to keep you from being a slave to sin. It all comes back to definitions, people. What you call genocide, this was not genocide. And I think we've made a strong case for that, just looking at the whole corpus of Scripture. Because you see, when we get into the later part of Scripture, Jesus spends time with Samaritans. He spends time with people who aren't Hebrew. Because his heart has always been there. When we talked about, is the God the same in the Old Testament and the New Testament? 
God asked Israel to be the lighthouse into the nations, to draw them unto him through love and grace, and to accept the travelers. The question is, will we? And if we want to look at freedom as being free to sin however we want with no consequences, no, that is not how our God listed as freedom. We are free from the pain of sin and death through grace. Because he's a holy, holy God. And until I realize how much I have not just offended, but transgressed him personally, will I ever understand how much he truly loves me. It's easy to say I love you to someone who's been kind to you your whole life. It's another thing to say someone to say I love you to the one who killed your son. And that's our God. So I want to thank you. I know these are tough conversations. I know there's probably many of you who may may not agree. Maybe you you fall differently on this. And um, I would love to unpack this with you. Um, if, if that is the case, I'm definitely not here to say you're wrong. I, I would love to talk to you about any of these subjects. Because I believe the answers are there. And as much as I can find things that are difficult, I when I'm trying to be honest, God opens up his word. And you have to contextualize this stuff. That means look at it in its proper viewpoint. That's what's fair. If you read just a couple of these texts, you would say, wow, God is just this monster. But if you look at the whole corpus of Scripture, you see God's redemptive plan working out, including with the people that are supposed to be quote-unquote cleansed. So if you have questions, email us staff, newday416.church. If you want to talk, please don't hesitate to reach out. We love you guys. Have a blessed and wonderful week. And we'll see you on Sunday.